Hello and welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host, Lisa Ann, and I'm excited to be in your ear and I would like to extend my gratitude to you for making me a part of your listening experience. If you enjoy watching the video component of my podcast, we can do it together on Friday night. So every Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time on my YouTube channel, The Real Lisa Ann, the same as all of my other social, I host a live premiere. Now, of course, last week, I was in Las Vegas, which we will talk about coming up very shortly. And I was unable to make the 8 p.m., but I will be there with bells on this week because I am so proud of this interview. I just completed it. I had been wanting to have this guest. I can't spoil it for you because we got a lot to talk about before I get to our guest. It's the monologue. It's when we get to like get to catch up. And there's a lot to catch up on as here we are Closing in on April already, the NFL draft around the corner, NBA playoffs pretty much around the corner. MLB has popped off. Day one, we get the wildest Shohei Otani news of all wild news in the MLB. Uh, There's a lot going on, but for here right now, just got back from an awesome trip that I can't wait to share with you and just was in studio for more episodes of Better Halves, and I took my co-host, Brett Raybould into the bonfire last Wednesday night, and we were on the show as guests promoting the show, cracking jokes, doing our thing. We brought Lainey, and I scheduled a dinner for the three of us, a family dinner, I call it. You'll see the photo because it will be in the video component at Bill's Supper Club on 54th, one of my favorite spots to be. I actually have my own table, so it makes it a lot easier when you want to meet up with people because everybody knows where you're going to be sitting. They also sell my wine, Lisa by Lisa Ann. So we went to do the bonfire. This was Wednesday. I was leaving first thing in the morning, Thursday to go to Vegas. So I knew I was going to pull the all-nighter, be out. Mind you, an all-nighter at my age in my situation does not mean I'm out partying. It means I'm going to stay up and work uh, and pack and clean my apartment because I like to leave and come back to a very clean apartment and then go directly to the airport so that I can sleep my flight away. So we go to Bill's, we have a beautiful family dinner because I wanted to thank Lainey. I'm not sure if you know this, but Lainey Spicer, who I've had here on my podcast, PR to the stars, friend of mine for 20 years, she is who introduced me to Brett. Brett is one of her clients. Uh, Brett was brought to me for my podcast back in 2021. That was when the spark happened, the seed was planted, and now here we are, new episodes every Friday on Raw Comedy. If you're a listener on the Sirius XM in your car and you listen, Raw Comedy is channel 99. They air our episodes, our new episodes on that Friday, and then they replay them through the week. The live air times are 10 a.m., 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. all in Eastern time. And that's Raw Comedy Channel 99. Or if you're an app user like myself, don't have a car. Uh Even though when I had a car, I found it was easier on the app because I had my favorite set up and I would just Bluetooth it. And I always just felt like it was was just easier than going through all the many, many, many channels at SiriusXM. So you just search Better Haves and we're right there. So we had a great dinner. I pulled the all-nighter, I got to the airport, and I realized like the airport is just easier when you're tired because nothing phases you. You just want to get somewhere. For me, it's getting to the lounge. I know the first thing I'm going to do at the airport is I'm going to set up a couple Instagram posts to go out while I'm in the air. Once that's done, I use the airport and downtime, even on the plane, to delete things from my phone that I no longer need. I don't know about you, but if I'm at a friend's and I see something I like, a snack or whatever, I take a picture of it. If I'm going somewhere and meeting friends, I screen grab it. If I meet some new friends and put them, follow them on Instagram, I screen grab their Instagram so I don't forget who they are because they're going to get buried into this whole kind of thing. And so I use that tedious time to help me really unwind and fall asleep. I got to Vegas early on Thursday. You never know if you're going to get a room. And luckily I did. Got in, no problem. Now this is like 1130 in the morning. I'm already in my room. And a Thursday was going to be my day, just a personal day, just a day to myself. I just was praying that there would be nice weather, which there was. I just threw my bag in the room, put on my bikini, took myself out to the pool and just three hours, no phone, no nothing. 
just three hours, just chilling in the sun, listening to the music, feeling the beautiful Vegas March. It's cool breeze, hot sun life. Fantastic. Back to the room, do a couple hours of work, get a shower. Now I'm going to go to dinner. Let's see where I'm going to go. Uh, there was a beautiful Italian restaurant. I walked in to speak to the girl working and she's like, Hey, are you by yourself? And I said, yeah. She goes, well, we have these cabanas and it's empty. So I can perch you up over here and there's a TV in there. You want a remote? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to watch some, some March madness. Uh, it's only five o'clock. So it's dead. And also this hotel wasn't busy on Thursday. So I sat there for a couple hours. I ate, I watched games. I used that time to text with some friends that I haven't gotten in touch with for a minute. And by now it's like 7.30. And I'm like, well, it's 10.30 to me coming from the East Coast. I have no problem with tucking myself in bed. And I was asleep by 8 p.m. on Thursday night. It's smart when you know you pulled the all-nighter the night before. And I have a long day the following day. I'm getting picked up at 11.30 in the morning. I knew I was going to be at the club from noon to 3.00. Uh, then as always, I love to go to the dry bar at the cosmopolitan. She curled my hair on Saturday and look, it's still curly. Those of you listening on Wednesday will not be able to look until Friday night, 8 PM Eastern time on my YouTube channel. But, uh, yeah, I'm still rocking with it because she did such a great job as again, playing with it for those of you listening, uh, go to the dry bar. And then we do a family dinner with everybody from Sapphire. And then after the family dinner, back to the club till from 11 to two o'clock in the morning. So it's a long day going to bed at 8 PM. No big deal. I slept till six and woke up and felt like brand new. I'm like, all right, I'm going to get in some yoga. I'm going to get a little work. And then my partner in crime who does all my West coast trips with me, Austin was coming in from Denver at eight 30 in the morning. So we were going to go out breakfast and get ready for our big day. The trip was awesome. I met some people that I haven't met before. And there was a group in there and they do this trip every year to Vegas for March Madness for the past 20 years. They ordered a cameo from me as a hype video without knowing that I was going to be in Vegas. So I was able to get their names, you know, for the nighttime, get them on the door. Like, you know, just the connection that you make from these random different applications and ways that we work, whether it's social media, cameo, all of these things. So I got to just kind of during the day, I hold court, I go table to table, chat it up with people, take photos with everybody, have a good time. Our contestant from the Build a Bracket, uh, Nick Valletta, came in and he was there for the day event and the night event. You might have seen him spinning a ball on his finger on my IG at the release and great to sit and chill with him all over an awesome trip. Now, in my practice of being more deliberate this year, those of you who are longtime listeners know that when I came back in the new year, I talked about the fact that when I evaluated my year at the end of the year last year, I realized it was important for me to be more deliberate with my time this year because I probably wasted between 30 and 40, maybe 45 days packing and unpacking, staying a day extra at trips, which adds more things to the packing, you know, just really extra. How can I weed out that extra? So one of the things was being more deliberate about my flights. I love the red eye from the West coast. It's to me the best way to travel. I'm not missing anything. Everybody that would be trying to reach me is sleeping. So I don't have to worry about missing emails or, or catching up on emails. I like to relax on a plane. I like to watch some movies. I really do. Even though you can go online, you can text and you can do emails. I choose not to. When I have to, I do, but I really prefer to use that as my downtime. So here I am like, okay, I'm not going to book the red eye on Sunday night because when I do that, I land on Monday morning and it is such incredible traffic getting back into the city that it might add anywhere from an hour to two hours onto that situation. No. So I'm going to take the Saturday night red eye. Austin's going to fly back to Denver at like 7 PM. I'm going to take the 1145 PM so that I can see my friend Christian, our friend Sullivan, and we can go to dinner at six. And then Christian and Sullivan can drop me at the airport. So I had this thing all organized. Friday, we worked all day. Saturday, we got up, pushed the late checkout. How fun is that? Why is it so fun when you're at a hotel to push the checkout? Why? What do you think you're getting the wool over on somebody? We did. We left the room around one, went down to that same spot, got that same area at Cabana, turned on the TV, had the games on, got to see Caitlin Clark had already played. So we missed her game, but I got to watch it later. Just sat, chilled, had brunch, watched games, and relaxed for the entire afternoon until Christian was picking me up at six. So it was just the perfect wrap on the trip. 
until I got to the airport on Saturday night. This is when things dramatically changed. And when they changed with a level of such confusion, there's going to be layers to me explaining this to me, you, so buckle up. I get to the airport for my 1145 flight and I see that it's been delayed to 1245. Oh, there's a very important fact that I forgot to give you. If this was building story 101, I'd have failed. But one of the things about being more deliberate and adding in the packing and unpacking and the one last day was you will make this trip with a carry on. You will not check a bag. So what I did Wednesday night before I left was I brought up two suitcases, my carry on and a regular suitcase that I would have to check. And I said to myself, if if you can't do it, you can't do it, but you're going to get your hair done. So you don't need to bring any hair products. Uh, you know exactly what you're wearing. You're not really going anywhere else. You can throw on the same jeans twice. Not going to be a big deal. And I did it successful mission, carry on bag and backpack. And I have this really tiny purse that that's crossbody purse. I just tuck that in my backpack. It's kind of like a wallet to me when I'm traveling. So I get to the airport and I'm like, okay, flight's delayed till 1245. No problem. I'll make all my reels from the trip. I'll get some work done. No problem. But when I went to look at my boarding pass, I didn't have a second boarding pass. I had three boarding passes. Now my Charlotte flight has been canceled. And mind you, yes, I could have flown direct to JetBlue but I am just reaching the next level to carry on my executive platinum for American Airlines and I don't want to lose it. And so I know I have to struggle through some layovers right now and stay only on American because American and JetBlue are no longer one. I can't book JetBlue. Anyhow, back to this. So now I'm like, I'm not upstairs yet. If you've been to Vegas airport, check out in his downstairs, take an escalator up to go through security. Not upstairs yet. I'm downstairs. Counters are empty. It's Saturday night. The airport is dead. And I'm thinking, did they cancel this flight because it wasn't full enough? I'll be pissed. So I go up to the counter and I said, you know, what's happening? And I was like, it's been a crazy day and they have canceled a bunch of these Charlotte trips. And I'm like, well, not only do I have two layovers to get back to New York from Vegas, but I've been bumped into like row 35 middle seat. This is when it becomes absolutely unacceptable. So please tell me there's another option. So we find that there is a DFW option. I lay over in DFW. I have a four hour layover and then I can get direct to LaGuardia. Okay, fine. It's going to be a longer day than I expected, but it's still better than two layovers. Who's doing that? Uh, and the layovers were super tight. So there was no guarantee. I also tried to find a flight into Philly because I was like, I could just take the train back to New York from Philly, but why am I going through all of this? So I'm like, okay, fingers crossed. Let's let this happen get on the flight, 1245, go to DFW, land in DFW to find out that I now have been handed something new, a delay, 11 hour delay. 11 hours is not a delay. You might as well cancel my flight and let me go stay at a hotel, right? Let me have options. So I get off and everybody on my flight was pretty much there connecting to go somewhere. So there was a Boston flight that had a similar situation. There were a bunch of people going somewhere to go on a cruise. They had a similar. So everybody is now going to E35 where the American Airlines people are and trying to work out their travel. There's no way I'm getting in this line none, absolutely none. So I sit down with myself and I'm like, what other options? And I looked down at my carry on and I said, because you have a carry on, you have every option. You can easily just buy a ticket on another airline. So I went to Expedia, found a one-way ticket from Delta was flight for the flight was taking off around 1 PM no problem. Direct into LaGuardia. Okay, great. I'm going to buy this flight. I'm going to get on the tram. I'm going to go to a new terminal. I've been American Airlines loyal for so many years. It's like a new adventure. I felt like I was in a new country going to a new terminal. I'm going to go to a new terminal and I'm going to talk to new people. So now here I am, me and my carry on my backpack, super excited. We didn't check bags because so you know, if you check in a bag on a leg to a trip and they assign you another flight, If you don't get on that flight, they have to remove your bag and it holds everybody up. And the last thing you want to do is hold everybody up. If you're considerate and mindful of others, you don't want to do that. So I get down to the Delta area and I decide, you know, I have this boarding pass on my phone. Let me go and get it printed out. Let me speak to someone. And it just so happens I go up to a counter with the sweetest woman. 
just the sweetest woman. She looks at everything and she's like, are you trying to get back earlier? I assume, by the way, this is at six o'clock in the morning. She's like, I assume you don't want to sit here till one. I said, preferred not, but American was offering me 11 hours. This cuts the difference. She's like, I'm going to put you on standby. She goes, your flight takes off out of that gate, which was two gates over. And it's the same flight all day. I'm going to put you on standby for the 720. There's 10 seats available. Trust me, you're going to get on. And I said to her, oh my gosh, I didn't check a bag. I've never done standby before. This is so exciting. It's kind of like gambling in Vegas. You don't know what's going to happen, but Delta, pretty good stuff. I mean, there was a board and let me know how many seats were available throughout the whole waiting process. And I was like, hmm. Delta has a couple things on American and American is not on my wish list right now. I'm fighting for all these, making sure I have all these miles. What I also did was I canceled my American leg home, contacted American to make sure that I would get the flight credit because I figured that flight credit was going to offset the price of what I just paid for this ticket. So here I am sitting there at seven o'clock. Everybody loads. There's still these seats left. I board. I have a middle seat. I don't care. Guy hands me my thing. Whatever. I'm so happy. It's 720. I'm be home by noon. So I get on the plane and I go to my middle seat and it's taken. And the kid says to me, do you mind taking my seat? I want to sit by my friend. I said, okay, no problem. Where's your seat? It's one row up at the window. And who would have thought I could even got on last and there'd still be space, but it was a pretty empty flight. And most of the people must've checked their bags because there weren't a lot of carry on stuff. So I'm like, how is this happening? This just turned from the absolute worst experience. I threw a little money at it and I'm in a window seat. And American has no TVs anymore on a lot of their flights if you're not at first. And so Delta has TV the whole time. I'm like, it's great. I'll watch The Office till I fall asleep, what have you. So it ended up being how this all worked out and couldn't have worked out better. If I would have checked a bag, none of this would have been an option. I'm going to tell you right now. I was so excited to do today's interview that my biggest fear with getting – normally, I would be like, you know what? I'll just stay at the Grand Hyatt. I love that air, uh, hotel at Dallas Airport. I'll call a friend. Whatever. Normally, I wouldn't have even been tripping. Um, but I was like, I'm not going to reschedule this interview. I really want to do this interview. And my whole plan – to not sit in rush hour traffic on Monday is being derailed because Americans going to put me on a flight that's going to put me in rush hour traffic. So how the thing worked out and the fact that I was able to buy the ticket so it made me realize why you want to be prepared in life, why you want to have business, uh, some money stashed in your business account, why you want to be able to throw some money at it when you have to. And it felt really good to make that decision because at first I was like, do you want to buy this ticket? And I'm like, no, I don't want to. But in reality, if it's going to make my life better because I'm going to get to come home, unpack, get ready for my week, order my groceries, you know, do a little bit of work, get a good night's sleep. If I want to do all of that and be ready for my Monday, like I feel right here right now with you, got to buy the ticket. So worth it. So worth it best money I've spent in a long time. But I don't know what it was yesterday because there was no weather anywhere. An American, you know, not reaching out, just sending three boarding passes into the app for me. And I was without a choice. I was like, what? Who is doing this willingly? Who knows what it may have been? I haven't read anything in the news today that maybe they were having a, a shortage, a systems failure, but whatever. If I packed luggage. I would not be here right now doing this podcast and I would be just getting home. So it's really wild how it all worked out. Again, it's part of reeling it in, being more deliberate, staying, not staying that extra day. I don't have to pack the extra clothes, being able to get in and out. So efficient. It was so exciting. And I'm absolutely thrilled that I made it home and not only made it home, but like got a window seat, which is my jam. I like, I like a good window seat. I put my little pillow here. You know, I got my little, it's just comfortable. You feel like you have a little bit more space. Um, wild travel on the way home. And here I am. So worth the trip. Great to see my friends. Always have a lot of laughs with dinner at Christian. We've known each other since 2005. Our friendship just develops and we laugh a lot. We have so many, it just, we have so much history, just absolutely great stories. And so it was an awesome trip. It was a little bit of a debacle getting home. But again, if I would have packed luggage, I would have been stuck. And I'm so glad that I made the decision. Even Kay, I texted Kay and said, Kay, I've taken this trip with a carry-on. You should be very proud. Very proud. Kay has seen me drag a lot of suitcases. And that's the person I'm 
trying not to be. Who I am trying to be is healthy, aware of, of different ways that I could adapt my lifestyle for optimal health. And when I did that nutrition series last year, I talked about a book that I had just read and that was Eat, Stop, Eat. It's about a one day a week, 24 hour fast, or maybe you'll do it too, but not back to back. It's 24 hour fast. It's fascinating how your body starts to heal itself, gets rid of old things that's storing for no reason. For me, you're going to hear some of my results that I talked to this week's guest with, but this is why. This is why I was a savage when it came to getting home because I could not wait to have this conversation with Brad Pilon, who you are going to follow on Instagram at Brad Pilon and learn a lot from please also consider going to Amazon today. It's an easy cover to cover read. Right here, we have the author of Eat, Stop, Eat. Another day and another opportunity to have an incredible conversation. And today's conversation is something that I'm really excited about because not only have I read the book and not only have I been following the daily, the regular information on all social, that's Brad Pilon, the author of Eat, Stop, Eat, a book <laughs> that was a six-month experiment that is now a huge part of my everyday life. And I've ordered the book for other people, Brad. It is so nice to have you here. Oh, it's fantastic to be here. So Brad, before we start on writing the book and really yeah. the process of fasting, understanding your body, let's ask this and make everyone think, when do you think we became a society that changed our relationship with food? Because your book does remind us of what it was like in the caveman era when people didn't have as much food and how smaller portions were elongating lives, which we see in blue zone cultures. Yes. Where did we get here where we are a society that is so unconditioned that food has to be a part of everything? I think it just grew on us, especially in North America, as we grew into city centers. And with a city center became your, um, your local grocer, your local grocer became your regional grocer, and your regional grocer became your national grocer. And we started to realize that we have all this amazing data on how and why people buy food. And from that data, we were able to really start working out, you know, Lisa's going to buy more if the Ritz packaging is red than if it's a slightly off red. And, and if we move certain foods to the front of the store, you're more likely to buy it. And then you know what? If we, if we package it in sixes instead of eights, they're going to come back more often and they never just buy one thing. And we've just learned how to game the system. You're not buying based on um, what you're hungry for that day. We, we don't have that European concept in North America of, I'm going to run out, grab a baguette, and then some wine because Lisa's coming over tonight. I know she likes some cheese. I'll grab her some cheese. I do this shop where it's, um, okay, I'm getting a week's worth of groceries for the kids. I show up with my list, and if my list has 20 things, I'm buying 30, and I don't even know why I bought the other 10. But they're in my house. All right? and it's then, a psychology. Yeah, it's complete psychology. But they also know that we're, we're going to eat it. And even if we don't eat it, because they don't really care if we eat it, it's going to go bad. We're going to throw it, it out. Yeah. Exactly. We so waste we've, we've a become... lot of food in this country. <clears throat> exactly. So the, the it's never been about health in that sense. Health is our own responsibility. And companies who sell food, their responsibility is to have enough money to pay their employees and make massive profits. So they're not evil. Because, you know, we always get that old evil corporation thing. They just... Their interests are their people, and our interests are ourselves and our, our families, and we need to sort of reclaim that in terms of how we decide to eat. Problem is, the information is so conflicting. It is so conflicting. We're also a convenience society. So mm -hmm. many people will go down those center aisles of the store and buy things that could potentially live longer than you uh, <laughs> and, and not feel any fear of putting those things in their body. Because right. the food pay, plays a big role in it because up until reading your book, Eat, Stop, Eat, I had been interma intermittent fasting for probably the last 10 years. And right. so that was wow. very normal to me. But one thing I would do is on my travel day, I would always fast for 24 hours when I got home from a flight due to inflammation, due to all of the different factors and things that you feel. And it really right. helped me get back on whatever time zone I was trying to get on. Something about that helped. So your book really resonated with me. But oh, it's a very different mindset once you start 
saying, I can do this because it changes your own response when you think you're hungry and you're not on a non-fast day. So Absolutely. the psychology of just taking one day and beating the system in your own mind and realizing I'm not hungry, I'm fine. It's fascinating. How did you get here and what made you decide to write Eat, Stop, Eat? Great question. So I've been in health and fitness since I was a teenager. I worked in your local supplement shop. I was selling supplements as a 17-year-old was it, wait, wait, wait. Was it GNC then? No, I'm in Canada with a company called Healthies. I'm not sure if they're still around. <laughs> great, great brothers ran the company. Um, I went from there to do my uh, undergrad in human nutrition. I went from my undergrad in human nutrition to the supplement industry. So now I'm working in the R&D department of some of the largest supplement companies really in the world as, as they grew. And then around 2006, I was sitting across the table. We were having a massive meeting with a bunch of people who were doing the research for us. And I think we were in Scotland at the time because we had research. It's one of those companies that said they had a multi-million dollar research budget and really did. So I was all <laughs> over the world doing research. Amazing. And they were... Yeah. And they were talking about the problems they were having with the study. Lots of lots of problems with the planning and the implementation. And I just sat there thinking, I'm on the wrong side of this table. Like I'm on the on the money side and I'm funding this research, but I, I don't want to do what they're doing. So I I left the the supplement industry and it was a great industry to work in, but I really wanted to, to know more. And so I went back to do my grad work. And we started with the obvious assumption that there is a ideal diet for everyone um, because I'm a pompous 29 year old and I think I know everything. <laughs> so the best place to start would be to show all the horrible things that happen to you when you fast and then build up from there. Because we all knew in the you know early 2000s that if you didn't eat every three hours, your metabolism would crash, muscle would melt off your body and you would just be a fatigued disaster. And so I That's started there. That's what they there. were telling us, though. That's what they were you, telling us then. They were. Yes. And yes. it wasn't just the supplement companies and the magazines. It, it was dietitians. It was doctors. The prevailing wisdom of the time was that you, if you wanted to be healthy and lose weight, you just had to eat as many times per day as possible. Like every two or three hours. I used to carry food in Tupperware containers to go to a movie. Like it was, <laughs> it was extreme. So I started with that assumption. And I pulled research papers on fasting. And I... I didn't see what I was expecting to see. And so I did what any, again, pompous 29-year-old would do. And I chucked those papers in the garbage and I pulled more research. And I still didn't see what I wanted to see. So I had a bit of a decision to make, right? Did I go along with my assumption and keep studying what I would hope to turn into like this perfect diet? Or do I look at fasting and figure out what's going on? What are we missing? And I decided to go with fasting, which was an interesting thing to do because in research, especially in nutrition research, there's usually a placebo group. And a placebo group is usually getting something fake. So you're getting the cool active pill and I'm getting nothing. Right. But we're fasting. So a lot of studies at the time had these groups of people who were doing 16, 17, 18 hour fast, then doing a workout and then fasting for another four or five hours while things are being measured. So I had all this data available to me that we were able to pull together and look at the effects of short-term fasting, so 12 to 72 hours, on human metabolism with a, a special interest in weight loss. And that's what Eat, Stop, Eat actually is my graduate thesis, just sort of expanded and made a bit more interesting to read. That is fantastic and fascinating. But well, in you. Eat, Stop, Eat, even though you just mentioned 12 to 72, you do talk about what you learned. The sweet spot is actually 24. 24 yes. is an easy thing as you explain it because yeah. you can eat dinner at 6 p.m. And then the next night you can eat dinner again at 6 p.m. So it's not like you're going even a whole day if you map it out perfectly. And you laying it out like that and Eat, Stop, Eat, Brad, was really the first time I saw it as such a simple 24 hours. Yeah, when you're working with um, university populations, so you've got young, not kids, but young adults, right? Yep. And then you've got the older uh, crowd in the neighborhood. Convincing someone to miss a day of eating was next to impossible. But convincing them just to miss 24 hours, so I'm like, you're going you're gonna to eat today until 4 p.m., and then you're going to get up tomorrow, you're going to go to class or do what you do, and then at 4 p.m. tomorrow you can eat again. And psychologically, that worked really, really well. So that it was just finding a time 
And, you know, the magic of 24 was if it's 4 p.m. today, it's 4 p.m. tomorrow. Easy. Right. No, no hard thinking. It was enough time where, generally speaking, if you timed it right, you slept through the hardest part of the fast. And it's adjustable. So if I'm doing 4 p.m. to 4 p.m. and then you try it out and you're like, ah, Brad, I just I don't feel it. I, I, I want to eat a bit later on. And I can say, well, Lisa, and have you tried 7 p.m. to 7 p.m.? You try that, and you're like, that fits. That's great. Mm -hmm. It fits my current lifestyle with, with what I'm doing and how I'm traveling. And you can adjust it as needed. So maybe during summers, you're noon to noon because you, you want to get up and have brunch, right? So it's that flexibility, the ease of the 24 hours that really sort of moved it into a zone where most people could do it. And for you, I'm sure that you do your 24-hour fast a week. Do you also intermittent fast throughout the week, or is it just one 24-hour fast for you? I'm one or two. So if I'm roughly looking the way I want to look, it's one. And then if summer's coming up or it's just been, you know, after it goes Christmas, New Year's, Valentine's Day, Super Bowl. I mean, that's a bad little runway, right? So sure. then after that, it might be twice twice a week. I do occasionally do um, in between my 24-hour fast, I'll do 12-hour fast. So my general rule of thumb there is that there is really no reason for me to be eating after 9 p.m. Oh, if I'm yeah. eating after 9 p.m., I've sat down, I'm watching a show, and it's going to be way too much food because there's just it's just a weird timeline. So if I can cut myself off at 9, start back up next day at 9, everything is great. I do that occasionally. I've shied away from your traditional 16-8, um, those type of fasts. Not that there's anything wrong with them in my eyes, just that level of inflexibility doesn't fit my current lifestyle. So... The thing about a 24-hour fast, let's say you and I are planning on fasting today, and then we got a call from someone and they're like, you guys want to come out for dinner? I don't want to have to say, I'm going to skip dinner because I'm fasting. I want to think, I'm going to move my fast one day, I'm going out for dinner. So I like that flexibility. Yeah, I get that. I make mine very flexible as well. But like yesterday I was traveling and when I messaged you to confirm today, I let you know it was my fast day. So what I realized was on an airport day for me oh, is an ideal yeah. day to fast because you're not tempted by bad food. There's nothing but bad food at the airport and there's oh, no yeah. reason to just go there and sit. And I've also read so many studies about how bad it is to eat when you're flying. You know, your whole yeah. digestive system is different. So I've made that a day. And if you think about it, I'm saving myself anywhere from 50 to to $100 if you have a layover oh, because yeah. everything oh. you buy at the airport, a bottle of water is $8, right? So like yeah. I buy my water, I'll have coffee because I do do coffee, tea, and water, but I never put yep. sugar or creamer in anything. So it's not a big deal for me. For a lot of people like, oh, I couldn't do black coffee. And I'm like, well, then you can't do coffee during a fast if you're going to put cream and sugar in it. Right. Because right. now you're not fasting. So let me tell you some of the amazing results that I had with okay. you, Brad, excited. before we get into. So I'm going to be 52 in May. Uh, oh, I'm okay. very fortunate that I've always loved working out. And I know that's not the same for everybody. So right. I empathize with people who don't like to be at the gym and try to convince them to find other ways to pretend they're working out, play ping pong, you know, yeah, pick absolutely. a ball, take a walk with a friend, whatever you could do to like disguise activity it, is disguise. Activity. Yeah. Activity yes. is activity. Um, but I had little fat pockets and spots like in the crest of my arm, okay. above my knees, little tiny spots that are just like older women things, right? You, right even if right. you're lean, you start to build up. And after my third month, I noticed in a photo, because I hadn't even been staring at it, you know, you ignore it. I noticed in right. a photo, it wasn't there. So those fasts that I'm doing once a week religiously are like you say in Eat, Stop, Eat, finally eating away at pocket fat areas in my body, lower a, a back under my triceps, right? right Little right. tiny spots, spots that we get as we age that we cannot figure out how to work out to get rid of them. They're really right. about gone. And that Amazing. has been fascinating to me because I never stopped working out. I don't like to use the word diet. I talk right. about lifestyle or nutrition, how because I think diet, people feel like it has a start and an end date. And it really mm -hmm. shouldn't. It should be something that you're weaving into your everyday existence in life. I also, how you eat. yeah, I love how I feel when I wake up in the morning. Yes. You just feel so clear. Uh, stomach is flat. Uh, going to the bathroom is always very regular. Uh, the clarity. And I think that's something that I didn't expect. The mental mm -hmm. clarity that you get after letting your body work through all what's been left in your system for 24 hours and how you wake up and kind of jump out of bed. 
Can you explain yes. that to me, Brad? It takes energy to digest and assimilate food. And your, your body is working hard. I mean, you're not thinking about it, but it does miraculous things without you even being involved. I mean, just the idea of breaking food down into these little sugars and amino acids, and then bring them into your body and then putting them back together and then putting them in the right spot. It's, it's amazing, but it takes energy and it takes part of your brain's focus, not yours, but your brain. Yes. After a while, you get to take a break from that. And when you're fasting and this break happens, it just frees up a little bit of time and space. But it's not just the subconscious stuff. Because for you and me, on days we are eating, we're thinking about what are we going to make next? Do we have enough groceries? Do we need to go out? Are we getting dinner or am I making dinner? And that takes up energy as well, right? So just freeing yourself from all that just for a brief period of time so it's new and novel allows this extra level of focus, this, you know, you have the energy to focus, you have the mind space to focus, and there's just an extra level of clarity that you can really sort of dig into. I like creative projects best, so I do most of my best writing when I'm fasting. Um, anything tedious is, it's okay, but the creative stuff is where I really feel I get my most benefit out of it. Fascinating. Yeah, I will add point. that into my thought process of doing it because that's something that's something new for me to journal and really think about. When yeah. you speak to someone about this for their first time, how do yeah. you give them their like top couple of things to prioritize? It is a mindset shift. It is a focus yes. of your own inner voice is going to tell you when you walk by your kitchen, except if you're working from home, oh, there's yeah. a snack in my fridge. I can go have it. The first month, you still have this dialogue with yourself about eating. And then after you get used to doing this once a week, I don't have that dialogue anymore. What right. do you tell someone who's willing to try this and put this in their life for a period of time? All right. So I tell them a couple key things. One, I start with a story. And that story was when I was doing my grad work from where I live to the school is one long highway. And on that highway, every 10 minutes exactly, there's a Tim Hortons. So a Canadian Dunkin' Donuts, our, <laughs> yes, our main coffee shop. I know Tim Hortons. <laughs> So I would stop religiously, right? Like it would, doesn't matter if I was late for a lab, I would stop and get a coffee and probably a donut. Then I started fasting and I would be 17 hours into a fast and I'd be pulling into the drive-thru. I'm like, why, why am I here? Habit. And then I would find that even on days where I'm just starting fasting, so I ate an hour and a half ago, I'm pulling in that drive-thru. Habit. So I tell them that the the main thing you learn from these, so e even if you try a 24 hour fast and you think, Brad, it's not really for me. It doesn't fit my lifestyle. The stuff you can learn by just doing it occasionally and what habits that you have that maybe you don't know you have that are driving you towards eating when you don't need to eat, just knowing them, being aware and being able to address them is going to make massive changes in your life. The next thing I tell them is that I obviously hear from a lot of people who do fasting. And what I find is the people who've read Eat, Stop, Eat, their first fast usually go well. The people who didn't read it, but heard from a friend of a friend that that's what Lisa Ann's doing, they try it and they don't go as well because I think in their head, they're a little afraid they're doing something wrong. They're doing something maybe bad for their body and they're a little bit hesitant. And so the fast feels drawn out. So it's important for these people to understand you're doing something that's good for your body. What you're doing right now, this active not eating, you're doing it on purpose. You have a defined timeline. In 24 hours, you're done. You're not just not eating until you have to eat. You've set yourself a limit. It's a little competition. And if you view it that way, you're going to do well. And the last thing I explained to him is by breaking up your week into small manageable chunks of eating. So you and I fast at today for 24 hours and we're planning to fast again on Friday or whatever the case may be. We've now divided our eating times up in these three or four day chunks that we can manage. And if you can make it through a fast, you realize I, I did that. I can do a 24 hour fast. And then if you make it through three or four days of eating really well, you think, oh, I can do that too. Then you reset with a fast and you start over as opposed to what traditional, as you and I talked about dieting is like, which is just if you're trying to lose weight, it's a slow, inevitable march to probably eventual failure because you're probably pushing yourself a bit too hard. And then what happens when you fail the diet? You spend a couple of weeks overeating because you feel bad for yourself. And then you, you refirm and you go, I'm going to diet even harder next time. 
and you come back with an even stricter diet that's going to doom you to failure even quicker. So I really like the idea with these stuff of chunking your diet into small manageable pieces where you just eat as well as you can, take a break, plan out your next couple of days diets while you're fasting, then get back into eating the way you like. And it just allows those little resets that make everything much more successful. Yeah. It also allows you to eat the things that you want to eat, you know, dieting yes. and eliminating everything you love. And then you just go on a food bender and, and you just eat all of this stuff. And then it hits you mm -hmm. really hard, you know, allowing yourself to eat what you want to eat. The challenge factor is right there. And I get why somebody that has read Eat, Stop, Eat, Brad would be much better at their fast because all of the knowledge, you know, everything from what's happening from this hour mark to this hour mark, understanding your own growth hormone, understanding what you're doing, it all made such perfect sense that I was like, well, yes, of course. Yeah. And I laughed when I had to go and get a physical and my doctor called to remind me that I had to, you know, not eat or drink past midnight. And I realized that yeah. years ago that sounded so daunting. But I for know. somebody that's yeah. been intermittently fasting for 10 years and now adding in this fast, it is not daunting at all. Uh, no. it, at all. It trains you. Also, knowing that when you go back to eating and you have this food plan, I've realized that I've caught myself from snacking since I've been doing this because mm -hmm. I've realized yeah. I'm not hungry. If you can yeah. go a whole day without eating, why do you think you need to eat two hours after you just had a full lunch? So I'm Absolutely. breaking overall food habits as well. And I'm sure you hear that from other people that talk to you about their response to a one day fast. We talk a lot about um, needing something to tide you over. So uh, you, you're running late and you, but you have a lunch appointment at 2 PM and it gets pushed back to three old think would be, well, you should grab a muffin because you need something to tide you over. You know, what you need is 450 calorie bomb of sugar and fat because you are waiting an extra hour to go and have mimosas with your friend. It, it's so absurd, but that's really the way we thought, right? Was that constant need to tide yourself over to have a little snack before dinner, to have a little snack before you're going out to dinner because you were going to have to drive for half an hour. And it was really pervasive in our views of food that it just, you constantly had to intake. And being able to step away from that does a couple of cool things. You enjoy your meals more because you've, you built up some anticipation. The other thing is if you don't waste 400 calories in a muffin, that just means 400 calories more of the actual meal you wanted, right? And it's, it's very easy to diet when you're a six foot four athletic man, right? When, when you're, you know, when you have to cut down to a 2000 calorie dinner, it's not hard. But when you're five foot two is your example, and it's, you know, you just get to eat less. You don't want that spread over the day as a, a yogurt and half a banana every two hours. You want a right. meal. Right. And that's one of the big benefits of by fasting, you learn to then take breaks, which means you learn to wait until it's dinner time, which means you get to have a good, hearty, filling, healthy meal, as opposed to these little snacks all the time where you're almost always kind of sort of hungry and yeah. never really full. Yeah. You're always grazing. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the things that I did to, you know, curb my sweet tooth years ago is, you know, they make all this fun flavored gum, like Mentos yeah. makes this like orange vitamin C gum, whatever. I could put that in my mouth and chew it for a couple of minutes and, and beat off that whole craving. And that's something yes. that I've learned to do only because I need to trick my own mind. And you know that if you're sitting in front of the TV and let's say you open a book, a, a, a trail mix, you're not going to yeah, be monitoring gone. how much. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and when I was still in the industry and I was at my, my cleanest, like really on my, on my diet, because I knew I was going to be on camera. I would take, if it said 12 portions, I would separate it into 12 portions and put it in yes. my cabinet that way. And then mm -hmm. I would only grab out one portion to take to my desk to work or what have you. And that really kept me, because most of the time you see 12, you know, you ate that bag normally in one or two sittings. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And this, some of them are impossible serving sizes, right? And yeah. they're just so snacky. They've got that perfect combination of sugar and crunch sometimes. That's what you want. You know, the... I, trail mix with chocolate it is just the devil it's so good it's the right? devil so, i had to stop yeah. ordering it i had to stop because i get my groceries yeah. delivered here so i'm like if you don't walk into the store you won't see it and if you get it off yeah. your list you won't take it um and also brad you do a lot of info giving on your instagram everywhere from working yes. out to switching up your workouts 
Is that a daily update that you do? And how do you put together so much awesome material? Is it all from working off of this thesis? It is sort of. So um, Eat Stop Eat was a right place, right time thing. So when I decided to take my thesis and publish it online as an ebook, as opposed to traditional in a sort of a scientific journal, it was exactly the same time where most of the world thought, you know what, I'm okay with putting my credit card online. I'm okay with buying things from the online world. So it allowed me to essentially live the life of an online self-published author, which is basically perpetual grad student. I'm always researching and then I'm always able to research things I'm interested in, which is always health and fitness. And so when I find little tidbits, I don't have anybody to share it with. My, my family does not want to hear me talk about nutrition or working out ever again. So <laughs> my Instagram family though, they love it. So we all the time, it's people I can share with and I, I really enjoy uh, Instagram is a, a social media where the messages are still generally uh, cordial and people have sincere questions or they have opinions they want to share and you can get some good conversation going. So it's a great spot for me to just jump on and be like, I was just reading a paper and I found this really fascinating or I was just in the gym and I was thinking of this and people seem to relate to it or have further questions or even disagree, which always is good. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a process of being a perpetual grad student for 20 plus years now in sort of a way where I've just, I have the time and space to constantly be researching and I'm looking for people to share it with. And that's what social media is great for. Yeah. It's incredible. I love your content. Yeah. Now, well, do you. you work out on your fast day? I do now. What I actually am currently trying, because it's always something new. Yes, is, of course, because you have to switch it up. You have to switch it up. Based yeah. on some relatively new information that came out just in December, I am now working out, then I'm eating a large amount of protein for me, and then I'm starting my 24-hour fast. So what I've found through available research is that larger amounts of protein, and we're talking significant, upwards of even 100 grams. Okay, tell us. What do you eat meal. that's 100 grams of protein? I will, I will lean towards a, uh, a lean protein source and a shake. I'll combine okay. that sort of one, kind of like I'm a high school football player from back in the day, right, where yeah. you combine things. And what I found is, A, from the research, uh, your muscle building – for lack of a better term, stays elevated for a very extended period of time. They measured for 12 hours, and at the end of 12 hours, it was still elevate, elevated. It might not go a full 24, but we know from Eat, Stop, Eat, we're not losing any muscle anyway. So I'm getting right. the elevated exactly. increase without any loss. But what I have also found is that approach, I think it's the extra protein, I'm really not hungry at all. I, I don't want to eat during my fat. I'm a little full. The protein takes a long time to digest, and I'm just sort of good. So that's what I'm trying out now. In general, I haven't been training in the middle of my fast. So 12, 14 hours, I can just wait. So it's usually been on the times I'm eating or right before my fast or even right after. Just never never in the middle because I yeah. always technically should be sleeping in the middle of the fast, which means I only have a couple hours left to go anyways. I can wait. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. How long have you been doing this protein load after our workout? Since and then January. You start Okay, yeah. so, so and how train, long do you, eat fast? Yeah. What time frame do you think you've collected data? Is it six? Because my goal was to do this for six months. Now it's forever. Yep. Um, yeah. Sometimes I'll try something for three months. I'll journal. Then I'll go to the six months. And I'll be like, okay, maybe I'm going to stick with it. Maybe I'm not. When do yes. you feel you've reached? I have this data since you started this in January, and we're already almost yeah. in April. It's crazy. Uh, three months. <laughs> I've got a good three months worth of information. It went by very very quick, and I, I like it. There aren't dramatic changes in my body, but I'm also 47. So a lot of what I'm trying to do is sort of that maintain and yep. find easier, more efficient ways to uh, look the way I want to look. So my goal is always to look amazing considering the amount of work I put in, right? So that's sort of the, the blend. I don't, it's very, it, not easy, but you know, if I tell people, well, I just work out four hours a day, seven days a week, that's kind of, that's a job, right? But if I can right. say I get away with looking pretty good for 47 training two to three times a week for just a bit under an hour that that sounds a bit like i'm cheating and that's kind of what i want is is that level of 
um, ease. But you're not cheating. You're doing both things. You're working on your body and you're letting your body work on you. You know, that's really what I pulled out of the fast is allowing our body to do what it needs to do to clear out trash. You're taking the trash out for that 24 hours. You're getting rid of unneeded cells. Uh, You're replacing them with new cells. So you work out those times, what is your average, your normal diet? You focus on obviously protein, as you mentioned, but also fiber. Cause I find I'll focus on high fiber foods the day before a fast. Cause they really yep. help me feel full. I am, I've been made fun of that. I eat like a 12 year old, but have abs. So I, I do focus on protein, uh, but I really like fruit. So my diet is a fairly high fruit diet. And then my staples, I, I like my potatoes and I like rice. Like I'm not a low carb person generally. I don't do a lot of fast food. I've never been a burger guy, but I'll do a, a sub sandwich and um, I'll do Thai takeout, that sort of thing. I, I have no problems with that. Uh, but in general, it's I'm always just focused on making sure I hit my protein goals. They're not extreme. I'm, I'm around 120 grams of protein per day, so it's not undoable. On the days where I am training, a large chunk of that is sort of saved for right after my workout. Okay. And then in general, it's fruit and it's thinking about what what can I eat now that allows me to then not have to eat for a couple hours. So then my, usually I'm a big lunch and dinner type of guy. I do eat breakfast. It's not a massive breakfast by any means, but I do, I'll have some watermelon and that kind of thing. Okay. And then lunch and then dinner is uh, generally what we're making for the family. So if we're having tacos, it's Taco Tuesday, right? It's just sort of, I want to be able to eat the foods my family's eating. I don't want to be... Here is everyone else's food, and dad's gonna go get his Tupperware container of chicken, rice, and broccoli. Yeah, so that's I, I no fun. That. Nobody wants no. to be that person. No, and it's funny when you when you think of the message you're sending to the family there as well, right? This is food this, isn't good enough for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. So, um, just with a, a little bit of tweaking, what you learn from fasting, you can really eat with your family. We have make your own pizza nights. It's not a problem, right? Because I know that everything is sort of balanced out by the end of the week. And do you cut off your time even when you're not fasting of how many hours you'd like to not eat before you go to bed? Because I think that's always been an important thing for me. Digestion, good sleep, all of that is affected if you eat right before bed. You feel awful in the morning. Yeah, there's something about, and I don't know what, I think maybe the foods are different for everybody. But some foods can just send you loopy while you're trying to sleep, right? And there's nothing worse than your stomach keeping you up, especially if you have a busy day ahead of time and you just regret that meal. So I do, I'm not a late dinner person because I'm also an early to bed kind of guy nowadays. But um, once dinner is done, a couple light snacks, they they happen. But it's never the um, high school mentality of, four bowls of Cheerios and a sandwich and then maybe something else before no, that, no, that no. giant buffet. I can't do it. So no, yeah. Like some like, nuts are good before bed. Uh, cashews yeah. can be good before bed. Even a banana, even though, you know, people mm-hmm. are anti the sugar in a banana, a banana and peanut butter is actually a decent late night snack if you have to have one, right? Because you're getting some protein, you're getting that banana. Yep. They are the top selling food in the world for a reason. I have no problems with bananas. Yep, yeah. none at all. And that's that yep. was one of the things when the diet craze hit 10 years ago of like friends of mine who were like, oh, I'm not doing fruit anymore. And I'm like, they're like, it's too oh. much sugar. And I'm like, well, I don't put sugar in my coffee or my tea like you do, but I am going to take sugar from Mother Nature. I am going to eat as much fruit as I want because yeah. it's it's – satisfying at your desk when you're grapes and blueberries. I can't live without them. You know what I mean? That's like compounded with polyphenols and fiber. Like it's not when you take something like sugar, rip it out of the fruit, condense it, powder it, and then throw it into a drink. That's very different than it's part of the design of a fruit. Right. It's, it's there. It's, it's been around, you know, blueberries has been around for a very long time. And yes, they've been cultivated to be a little bit sweeter, but in general, there's still a blueberry. And so, yeah, yeah, I have no problem with fruit whatsoever. I I love it. Those are our our nature snack. Now, since Mm -hmm. I talked about this on a podcast last year, one of my friends also went all in. He's Mm -hmm. already lost 15 pounds and really was doing it not as an extreme diet. Whatever whatever weight we both lost was just like a side effect to it. We just wanted to try it because we're both intermittent fasters. So he just had his second hernia surgery and he asked this. He said, this isn't really a question, but an observation that he kind of wants confirmed from Mm -hmm. my surgery recovering in regard to fasting. 
I fasted up until two days before the surgery and went right back to it a week and a half into recovery. Having this surgery twice now, I was wondering if that might have in fact helped my recovery. I can definitely say that I feel much further along now as opposed to how I felt after the first surgery. Is it just a coincidence or do you think there's some truth for it? Thanks for taking my question and writing this incredible book, Jeff. Oh, Awesome. Okay, so there's some truth to it. I've I had a uh, umbilical hernia that I had repaired way way back when I was powerlifting. So it's right above the belly button, and just by losing weight, they had to cut through less fat to get to the hernia. Oh, cutting nice. through less of you, yeah, exactly, means less recovery time. I mean, the, <laughs> it's <laughs> exactly. like mind blown right now. Okay, <laughs> right. But then after, no matter what, they got to cut you, right? They get into yeah. that surgery and they have to sew you back up. And there's going to be some inflammation around that area. Now, the initial inflammation, that's good for you. But then the prolonged inflammation, you want that under control, which is why we take anti-inflammatories. But fasting also has an effect on inflammation. So I do think that it has a benefit, not only just getting down a weight before they cut you open, but also in the process of uh, repairing that tissue, if you can get rid of inflammation and like we talked about earlier, maybe save some of the energy from digestion for repairing, yeah, there's a good chance that it could have helped. Absolutely. But just, but just making it so the surgeons had to cut through, you know, a quarter inch of fat instead of two inches of fat makes yeah, that's a huge ask any thing. surgeon. They, yeah, yeah. And for they men, that's that. where a lot of the extra weight is carried in the stomach. So it's a very, that, I mean, that mind blowing, but yeah. And the inflammation thing too, uh, hair and nails and skin, right? All affected mm -hmm. by what we eat, all affected by yes. our diet. I can't do dairy for these reasons. Um, but I've noticed a huge difference in my nails, hair, and skin since the one day fast as well. Because again, my oh, body is just doing all the right things, right? And you know mm -hmm. it, as your body is getting more active, I usually notice it at about the 17 hour point where my stomach starts gurgling. Um, I'll, I'll go to the bathroom a couple extra times in that time, usually just getting rid of, you know, waste, just, just number one, you know, just like yeah. you feel it, you're starting to extract, you're drinking more water that day. Cause that's what you're doing yes. to fill the void. And all Absolutely. of these things are just flushing out your system. But Brad, I am so thrilled that I got to have this conversation with you because Looking I love great. this book. It's oh, definitely a cover, cover read. It's one of these oh, things that's a little bit suspenseful where I want to keep going because I wanted <laughs> all of the answers immediately. And it's, right. and, it, and it's not a, you know, uh, it's a three for me, three, four hour cover read. That's yes. a nice read. I sat up one night, just going to start it and do a chapter or two because I read two chapters every night before bed of something. Oh, nice. And, but that night I was like, oh no, we're going to stay up. We're going to finish oh, this. Glad. And then right yes. away started telling my friends, you got to read this book. It's amazing. But this is really a way to use our bodies to do the right things for us and simplify our lives. And again, what I can't stress enough to people is how it trains you mentally to ask yourself the question of your relationship with food. And are you actually hungry? And do you need food? Or are you bored? Are you feeling a void? Are you frustrated? What is it that's making you open the fridge because you're not hungry? And that's exactly. been cool. Yeah. And I like we talked about earlier, I just like the idea of sometimes just get out of your body's way. It knows yeah. what it wants to do, right? Just get out of the way, let it let it repair, let it just take a break, let it do what it's going to do, and then start back up in 24 hours. Yeah. And everybody can give you a follow at Brad Pilon on Instagram. Where else can everyone Absolutely. find you? Uh, book is on amazon.com. I'm on X now. I'm going to use this ad, just Brad Pilon again. Um, blog is bradpilon.com if you want some of the older writings. And just generally, Brad Pilon. And if you type that in, you're going to find me to some degree. But Instagram is where I'm most active right now because I do not understand how to do TikTok. Well, luckily, we might not have TikTok forever. So we, we might that's not have true. to work. You're probably yeah. one of those people that's like, if that happens, cool. I don't have to hop on it. But I think this is your demo on IG. It gives you the amount of time that you need yeah. for the video. You have the captions. You have everything you need. And you can actually engage a bit easier in the comments, which is so important when you're putting out such useful information. But Brad Pilon, thank you so much for joining me right here on the podcast. I hope everybody goes out there and gets themselves this book and at least gives themselves the challenge. You can make it for Perfect. 24 hours. Trust me. And that's eat. <laughs> yes, you can. Stop, eat. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining me. You too. Thanks. That was the conversation I could not wait to get home for. This book has been so informative and I have to tell you, it is not just about weight loss. It's not even just about fasting. It's about your own mind playing tricks on you and making you think you should eat stuff when you really don't need anything and you having a better understanding of your relationship with food. 
I know that when I have downtime, I could easily sit down and eat just for just just to satisfy the urge. And that's not doing anything for me long term. That's just slowing me down. That's not how I want to be. It's not how I want to live. So reading this book was really eye-opening and inspiring. And also it made me throughout the week, I will question myself when I go to have something like, are you really hungry right now? Do you want to wait and have a good meal or do you want to snack and then you won't finish your lunch? Like, what are you thinking? This has been another way to kick it up a notch. You could kick it up a notch late night or anytime, but one of the spots in this city that I don't think gets enough love is Sapphire in Times Square. It's open later than anything in the area, and it's such a fun place to go in, have a cocktail, whether you want to see the entertainers, whether you want to listen to the music, whether you want to sit at the bar, watch some games. But Times Square Sapphire also serves my wine, Lisa by Lisa Ann. Right now, we are visiting Sapphire Times Square, also another carrier of my wine, Lisa to buy Lisa Ann. Let's go check it out. And now it is the moment that you've been waiting for the mailbag. I have three simple questions because I got to use one of our listener questions with my conversation with Brad. That was from Jeff. Thanks for sending it over. I've got three questions. Are you ready? All right. Mailbag is here. If you want to be a part of it, you can write to me at asklisaann at gmail.com. You will get an auto reply that will remind you that this is for a podcast and not to ask out on dates or weird things. I'm not sending my number or my WhatsApp number or anything like that. Ask a question. What do you want to know? We've got three here. Sam says, travel. Great question. Timely. What is the one thing you cannot travel without? I saw this question a couple of weeks ago and skipped it. So, so I'm, try, I'm, I'm making folders of good questions because sometimes we go through dry spells and we have nothing but bad questions. I saved this one because I was, I had traveled for a minute. I'm like, well, let me think about like what I put in my bag first. And this is going to be probably the last thing you expect, but I travel with a massive extension cord, a uh, sur uh, power surge protector. I have one that has the USB, the USB-C, a bunch of chargers, because when you're in a hotel, they either have a ton of receptacles that are in weird places or they don't really have any. When I'm at the airport, I don't want to take up 10 things, but I'm plugging in my router that I travel with. I'm plugging in my phones. Maybe I'm plugging in my iPad. Maybe I'm plugging in my computer. I could take up a lot of space. I'd rather sit up at one of those little desks areas at the airport with strangers, plug in. They always eye me up when I do it and it's in my backpack, not my suitcase. Plug that thing in. I got a surge protector. I got nobody's able to get into my data. Hopefully that's what I think. And I can plug everything in at one time. And everybody always looks at me like, that is really handy. So Sam, the one thing I cannot travel without is my own power cord. Not as exciting as everybody probably thought the answer would be here for the Lisa Ann mailbag, but question number two, Kelly asks, subject matter, social media. Hi, Lisa Ann. What challenges do you face when it comes to keeping up with all of your social media? Are you worried about the potential TikTok ban? P.S. 
I love your timelines. They're so positive, refreshing, and fun at all the time. Oh, Haley, thank you so much. Such a sweet question. Uh, what challenges do I face? So right now, I think the biggest challenge we're all facing is the amount of bots that are starting to appear again. And they're mainly AI bots. And so they look like girls. Instagram is crazy. Everybody that comments to me gets followed by these bots. And so I see it. And what I have to do is 10 minutes after each post, I have to scroll all the way past all of my comments before I answer any comments. And I have to go in. And what I do is I report to TikTok because then you can report it as spam, then it goes to them as spam. And then when I'm in too much of a hurry, I just hit restrict or I'll just hit delete. But the goal is to have them be restricted so they can't continue to do this. So I think the bots are adding a little bit of time per post, maybe 20 minutes per post. By the end of the day, that's an hour and a half. It's tedious. We're also seeing it on Twitter uh, where you put something up and then if you click that last see more things, you're like, whoa, what just happened here and why? This has nothing to do with the conversation. So I think right now the biggest challenge is keeping my community safe, getting rid of those bots, trying to avoid potential weird things, you know, because sometimes something can so casually look like mine, somebody might engage with that account. It's not a real account, what have you. I would say that is the most challenging because as for the things that you like that you said, uh, so positive, refreshing, and fun, I love putting the timeline together. I love the photo shoots to, to set things up for little flyers. I love the different things going out and sharing with you where I've been. You know, I love creating content. Shot a ton of cool photos at Sapphire Las Vegas this weekend that I'll be sharing over time. Shot some cool behind the scenes video that I'll be sharing. So like the sharing part, the creating and sharing is the juice uh, that gets me going, that reminds me to go down and get rid of the bots. It's like, it's like, it's like a trade-off. It's a yin and a yang, but I appreciate you loving my timelines for all of you. All of my accounts are the same at the real Lisa Ann. Second question about the TikTok ban. It would be one less thing that I have to do, but there is a little bit of an income on TikTok. So you're giving up a little bit of an income. Uh, it's not enough to cry over, but it's still, um, any money is good money, right? So there's that. But I will say this, if I wasn't spreading myself so thin, then maybe the other timelines would be even more vibrant. So it's one of those things. I'm neutral on it. The way I look at it now is it seems silly. We, if you ever read your disclaimer, your information with TikTok, you understood what they were able to access in your phone. To get rid of it now, I feel like they have everything they need from us, right? They have all of our data. Um, you know, what, what, what's really going to be? But we'll see what happens. These decisions usually get made around politicking. We know it's an election year, so we're going to hear a lot of hot topics that people either never cared about or care about just as something to make it seem like these candidates are, are working to do something. We're, we're conversation starters here. I'm not that worried about it. If it goes away. I lived without it before. I'll live without it again. Um, I do find there's a lot of bullying on there. I do find TikTok is better about anti-bullying. They send me messages almost every day that they're deleting comments of mine that people make to me. Um, but it's just one more place to have to deal with feedback. So Haley, I appreciate you. And if you want to follow my wine, my wine is at Lisa by Lisa Ann on Instagram. We got one last question here. Ties in very good with our guest Brad today and his book, Eat, Stop, Eat. Tom says, I love your podcast. After listening for a while now, I've realized how into fitness you are. My question is, would you date someone who is not into fitness at all. Love Tom. I would not. I would not. I am not looking for a guy that is, is a bodybuilder. I'm not looking for a guy with 0% body fat, but I am looking for somebody that takes an approach to wellness because that wellness also affects your mental health. It also affects your long-term health. Somebody of my age can't take the risk of dating somebody that doesn't take care of themselves and knowing that we're not going to have a vibrant future together, that we're not going to be able to go on vacations and ski and bike ride and hike and do all the things that I love to do. People get together because they're like-minded. So I think it's probably easier for people who aren't into the gym to date each other or aren't into fitness to date each other and people who are into, because these are really important characteristics of someone. These are defining factors in someone. So I think those are things that can't really be compromised in my space. Someone else might not feel the same, but I know for me, no, because I know if you're not taking care of your health, 
that eventually I probably will have to. And I also know that it's going to cost you and it's going to get harder as you get older. And what I'm looking for is life to get easier as I get older. Call me crazy, but I think anything is possible. I'd like to thank today's guest, Brad Pilon, for joining us. And I hope that you go and get, eat, stop, eat. For anyone trying to really get in gear and take care of themselves, and I'll tell you, like I told Brad, making my fast day now instead of the day after I travel, the day I travel, saving me a ton of money. Because with all of those layovers and my flight being changed, uh, I ate dinner with Christian around 7 o'clock. When I got to the airport, thinking my flight was going to be 11.45 p.m., but it was a.m., I sat down and I just had a water and a coffee because I didn't know how much longer I was going to be waiting there. And I realized that that's when people would start eating. That's when I would start eating. Okay, I'm bored. I'm stuck at the airport. Now I'm going to be stuck at another airport. I'm going to eat. It's very efficient. I was like, okay, save me a little bit of travel money. You know what I mean? Like why not? And also I felt really good. Got back yesterday. I unpacked everything cleaned my apartment up, but it gets dusty when you're not here. Uh, took a little nap in the afternoon, got up, got back to work, put myself to bed at eight, got a great night's sleep, ready to go today and eight. I had a smoothie first thing this morning. After I record this, I'm going to have myself some lunch. Uh, but it was an easy day. Uh, I It kept me also busier. I ended up getting organizing a bunch of files on a hard drive, organizing my phone. I ended up getting a lot of tedious work done because I wasn't distracted by eating. So wherever and whenever you decide to do it, even if you try to do it, you know, once a week uh, on a, a busy day at work, then you don't have to worry, get those extra things done, but try it out for yourself. For the rest of you, see you Friday. 8 p.m. Eastern time. I also will have a new episode of Lisa Ann's Backstage Convos coming out. We are starting a new season in April, and I'm starting to interview again this Thursday. So if you're not, follow Backstage Convos and check out my shows on SiriusXM, Better Haves. You can follow all social media at Better Haves SXM. That's TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, everything. And for those of you who want to ask a question, ask Lisa Ann is AskLisaAnn at gmail.com is the mailbag. Thank you all for listening to an all-new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. 